Well, let's uh, let's get a seat. Hey, so. Hey, um, we're not, we don't have any volunteers today because we, we have a, a guest and then we have some guests coming in on Zoom. And so uh, we're just straight up doing class. It's a, make sure you, by the way, when we're done with the quiz, you put your phones away and put your laptops away, okay? Laptops away now, actually. All right. So, hang on, here we go. So t today's class is a story. Wait, hang on. I need everyone's attention in the back. Okay. Today's class is a story. And the, the best way to follow this story is to pay attention starting from the very beginning. And that's why it's definitely important to be off your phones and to stay focused. Because if you miss a couple pieces of the story, it's not going to make sense. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting story that sheds light on some pieces of our society that we don't often get to see. So I'm, we're, I'm calling this when things fall apart, and that will make sense in, in a few minutes. Actually, by the end of the class. So, all right, we are ready. You know what? I think I should... Go ahead, you do it. So listen, I'm gonna, let me introduce the cast of, of characters here, the, the people who are part of this story. Um, Rafi Nadiri on the left, He's from Afghanistan. Serge Dadepo is Belgian, but he works at NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, he works at NATO headquarters here in the United States in Virginia. Rich Gary, who you are going to meet in a few minutes, uh, Colonel Rich Gary, retired. Uh, Rich, next slide. Uh, these two gentlemen, Harry and Niels, play a really pivotal role in this story. And I will explain what that is as we move forward. And let me start. It starts about Afghanistan. We're talking, go ahead, next slide. Uh, we're gonna talk about Afghanistan. And I, and I put this on the map so you have some idea, those who don't have an idea, of where Afghanistan is. And so, um, so just kind of to get a feel for that for a second. And then let me, let me give you a couple things. Go ahead. So Afghan, I'm not gonna, I can't give you the history of Afghanistan because it really, it, it will, your eyes will gloss over and it doesn't make sense and you don't need it. But what you need to know about Afghanistan is that 1996, a group of very extremist, um, militants who have been fighting for control of the government of Afghanistan were able to wrestle control from the current, what was at the time, the current government of, of the government of Afghanistan um, that was backed by the Russians and by the Soviet Union. Anyway, these guys got control, okay? And they were able to get control in, in very, well, actually, let me not say that, but they got control. And now they're running the country of Afghanistan. And these guys have a very extreme view of Islam. And actually, it's so extreme that probably the vast majority of the men who were part of this 
militia group who were part, ended up being part of the government, or a huge number of them, are, are not even literate. They don't even, they don't even read the Quran, and many of them can't even read the Quran, but they have a very extremist viewpoint of the Quran. All right, next slide. Um, and some of their extreme views are these things right here. No television, no music, no cinema. And, and Afghanistan had become a fairly, a pretty modern society by many standards, including many women in the 70s and 80s wearing miniskirts, okay, publicly and openly. It's very, very progressive in, in, in lots of different ways. No tobacco, which probably is not really a bad thing. Actually, no tobacco. No school for girls. Girls and women could not go to school. Men couldn't shave their beard. In fact, it was like a, a, a three-finger thing. You had to be able to hold your beard, pull your beard together with three fingers. No loud laughing for women. I mean, there's a long list of things, but these are kind of the silly things. No kite flying, no internet, all of these things. And women can not being able to leave the home without being fully covered and not being able to leave the home without men. So very extremist perspective on gender and sexual relations, okay? Now, next slide. So I say this because if you know nothing about Islam and all you know are things like the Taliban, you might imagine that Islam is a very backward religion. But here is a Muslim scholar. I just pulled this photo out. And there are as many Muslim scholars as there are Christian and Jewish scholars. It is, it is uh, the scholarship, the thinking and scholarship in Islam is really profound. And in fact, throughout the Arab world and the Muslim world, scholarship is extremely advanced in so many different ways, including in the ways of science. And I say this because it's, it's important that you not think that the men who were able to wrestle control of that government represent Muslims. They represent a narrow vision of Islamic thought. Very narrow. Okay, next slide. It would be as though these guys were somehow able to wrestle control of the government in the United States. And they had a very extremist Christian perspective, a racist, ethnocentric, extremist Christian perspective that they imposed on the rest of the country. And then the rest of the country had to follow these folks right here. Okay? So this is when you think Taliban, think these folks. All right? We good? All right. So now, next slide. So the story today starts right here on September 11, 2001. When a, a group, a small group of 20, again, extremist Muslim terrorists. And again, it's like, if you go back, if you think about that last slide, even to call them Christians, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even do an injustice to Christians in this room to call those knuckleheads Christians. So the so-called 20 Islamic terrorists, it's really hard to call them Islamic because of their narrow, distorted, and really horrific views and thoughts that they created for themselves out of Islam. But nonetheless, September 11th. Okay, next slide. This guy, and then I recognize that some of you may be cons have conspiracy theories or thoughts that, yeah, these guys weren't actually behind September 11th. It was an inside job. I'm not entertaining that right here. Right now, I'm just entertaining this other story, okay? This guy, Osama bin Laden, was the mastermind behind September 11th. And this guy was living in the hills, in the mountains, in the caves of Afghanistan. And the Taliban tolerated him being there, but he was there. And if you know anything about the terrain and topography of Afghanistan, it is not difficult for this guy to be living there and just minding his own business and doing his own thing. 
We can, I don't want to go further into that, but we decide pretty quickly he's behind September 11th, and then we go into, Af we send our military into Afghanistan to kill him. And in the process of sending the military into Afghanistan to kill him, we also overthrow the Taliban. So the militants who had taken over Afghanistan. Okay, good. That's where the story starts. That's the background of the story. Okay, let's do the attendance. And then we will come back and I'll take part two. watching online i'm assuming that you can hear this we're taking attendance right now um gonna be a really interesting class and uh and i'm really happy to have this gentleman behind me uh rich gary here today to do it with me and then we're gonna have some special guests who are calling in from europe um, our afghan colleagues so it's really a, it's an honor for me to be able to do this and uh to have this class and and Please put any questions that you have in the stream. I may not be able to get to it today, to any of them today. We may not get to them, but tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock Eastern time, I'm gonna do a, a kind of second thoughts um, about this class and take, entertain a bunch of questions in my head. All right, thanks. Are we good? Remember, if you, if you can't get on, if you can't do it, take a selfie. Are we good, everyone? You're on? Anybody not able to do it? Okay, so the story that, that we're going to tell today begins with this gentleman on the right. This is Rafi. And what happened is, as a result of the, the 13 years that elapsed between this dinner in Dubai at a Pakistani restaurant, this, what happened was the U.S. and NATO was trying to find some innovative ways to bring civilians in Afghanistan together with soldiers, and future soldiers as part of their pre-deployment training. So that when soldiers land on the ground in a conflict zone in a place like Afghanistan, they've already met some people on the ground. They've met citizens of the country where they are deploying. And the idea is that the more soldiers are prepared, the more they understand and the more they're prepared and the more they engage, the more likelihood that we can reduce conflict where conflict doesn't need to be and we save lives. We save the lives of innocent civilians and we save the lives of deployed soldiers because you, you don't want unnecessary conflict. So the military, NATO in particular, in an advanced thinking said, hey, you have this thing at Penn State called World in Conversation. Can you develop a dialogue tool that would allow our soldiers, before they deploy, to have conversations with people in conflict zones. And can you work in Afghanistan? So I reached out, I got on the web, and I started looking for Afghans, because they said, you gotta have an Afghan partner. And I found Rafi, and for some reason, I just knew that this was the guy. So I email him, he emails me back, he agrees to participate in this project, and Five months later, we're sitting in a cafeteria, we're sitting in a restaurant in Dubai. This is, the first, this is an hour after he and I had met officially face-to-face. -face. We both flew into Dubai together, all right? Next slide. So, before long, we're at NATO headquarters defending a grant. We wrote this 86-page grant proposal, and they, they invited us there and said, why don't you come and defend this in front of all the nations? And so in this photo here is, is that's me, the handsome guy on the left is me. Uh, my wife, Lori, this is Rafi, and this is Serge, the one on the right is Serge Dadepo. Man. 
And Serge had been a collaborator and a partner on this because Serge worked at, at NATO Allied uh, Transformation Command, okay? And Serge was a big proponent of this project and we all met and Serge's like, yeah, let's move this forward. And so the four of us go to NATO and we defend it and we get the grant. And, and now we're, this is the second time that I had met Rafi, okay? So this is us right outside of NATO headquarters. Go ahead. And on that trip, and this, I put this picture up here because this is a really important picture because this picture ended up saving Rafi's life. Um, we stop at an army base outside of Brussels. And we, you know, we, we were meeting with some folks who were gonna participate in, the, in, the, in, the, in our project. And we had, we had lunch with some of the officers. Okay, next slide. And here was the project, using video conferencing tools. We had a group of people in Afghanistan, so you see that, that that's the group on the top. Um, civilians, young people mostly. We have m cadets in military academies, and so the academy on the bottom right is an Italian, it, from the Italian Air Force, and then we had our two facilitators here at Penn State, and they would have these conversations and dialogues so that the cadets who would be deployed at some point, this is all part of their training, would have like a, the ability to have this conversation with people on the other side of the world. And this is important because we've, all, we've now started our Afghanistan dialogue. So you all are some people in this room, you swing, you sign up for them, have the exact same experience of having these conversations with, with civilians in Afghanistan. Okay, and then here's another slide. Um, next one. These are cadets. Um, at the at the at a, the academy in Be Belgium, I think, right? The Royal. No, this might be the Netherlands, actually. The Dutch Dutch cadets, and we're talking with young people in Afghanistan and facilitators at World in Conversation. So this is how it went, and we just did dialogue after dialogue after dialogue with, in the end, five different universities around Afghanistan, and people just talking and trying to really get a sense of what was happening and what was happening on the ground. And the Afghans really wanted to talk to the soldiers because the only thing they ever saw of soldiers is when the soldiers were just rolling through the streets. And they said, we actually want to talk to them. So next slide. Um, so we had a big team. This was a meeting that we have. We bring our Afghan team together with our Penn State team and other folks. This is one of the meetings in New Delhi. Next slide. Um, here's another meeting the next year in New Delhi. Um, this is our Afghan team. And, and then next one, and then we became friends, right? So now I've been seeing, Rafi was here in the United States. That very first photo that I showed, if you notice, that was right here in 100 Thomas. Um, and you know, his daughters become like my nieces. They are my nieces, right? I become Uncle Sam to them. So they become a, a, a really a deep, uh, a deep bond, just really, really cool, cool kids, right? And the beautiful thing about not having children is you get to be an uncle to lots and lots of kids around the world. So um, next slide. And so here we go. Um, as part of this, we start working with ROTC. We work with West Point. We work with a couple ROTC programs around the country, but we also work with Penn State ROTC. And these and ROTC, if you're not from the United States and you don't want you don't know what that is, it's, it's Reserve Officers Training Corps. And what what it is that it's an it's a it's a method by which people can study and then graduate. And, and as they graduate, then they become officers in the military. So you can go to one of the military academies like West Point or the Air Force Academy or Annapolis in Maryland for the Navy, or you can join an ROTC unit uh, or program on a campus. So these are all students who were here at Penn State studying just like everybody else, but they were also going to be in the military and serve for um, at least four years, okay? So in the process of that, I met somebody who happened to be their, uh, their commanding officer. And next slide. And, and that's this handsome gentleman right here who happens to be with us today. So Rich, come on up my friend and you will. <laughs> so
So this, uh, so first off, you, you <laughs> nice photos. <laughs> uh, he's rich, he's, wait, I'm gonna say something, cover your ears. He, this guy, he, he smiles a lot, he looks like he, he's a really nice guy, and he's a badass, all right? So, uh, so tell us, I, first off, I wanna ask you this question. How did you, why'd you join the military? Because we just had this conversation on Tuesday about the police. Yeah, I guess I, uh, I, I started off in Army ROTC back in, back in uh, I guess, 1991 when I graduated high school. It was something I wanted to do. I, I said I was only going to do it for four years. I just wanted to, you know, serve my country in some way. Military service was something that a lot of people in my family had done. Um, and I thought it was a it would be a good experience give back to my country um, You know, but I guess I guess maybe I really didn't know at that age right at 18 exactly why I wanted to do it um, and then I stayed uh, Beyond my four years uh -huh. uh, Because I was rated about four years when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. um, I was motivated by the events of 9-11 and I wanted to You know, I wanted to make it a difference I guess in the you know and protect you know at the time really motivated by a desire to protect the country and the people from what had happened on 9 11 and that's why i stayed at that point you know i think like so for a lot of these folks here i mean everybody here they really don't have an understanding of what 9 11 was like you know to wake up on that day with you know knowing what happened i mean the intensity of that and how many people were were motivated in that way so you were, you've been deployed, how many times were you deployed? Uh, to Afghanistan, I was, I was there five times, five actual deployments in addition to a couple short trips over there. And then I was in Iraq a couple of times mm -hmm. and then other, other countries, but those, those are the combat zones that I was in. And, and when you, so when you say deployments, just say quickly like what, what that means. Like deployment means that they just sent you over there to do your job. Sure. I deployed with a, you know, with an infantry unit. I was an infantry officer my entire time in the army. So, you know, we were, you know, what I did in my first trip, you know, was very different than what I did in my, my last trip. You know, the first time I went, it was much more kinetic, I guess, you know, there was a lot more enemy. We were trying to eliminate Taliban that, you know, that was in early in 2003. Um, it was still a very hostile environment It remained hostile, but Later on, the focus became more about the people and helping mm -hmm. the people. We, you know, we built skill, schools and we dug wells and we helped um, facilitate elections. Um, you know, and I really felt the last couple of times that I was in Afghanistan that you know that was very impactful. You know, I felt like we really did something positive. You know, escorting little girls to school. You know, building building schools, building health clinics um, in small rural communities so people had access to basic services and clean water. Um, and that was definitely more more impactful than the things that I, you know, did initially in Afghanistan. So, th so this is like, this is one of the things that I think people don't really realize or they don't have a sense of it, right? We talk about going to war and going, you know, you, you went to war and we think, oh, that means you went to war and we're just in conflict and people don't see the many, many different things that go into that. So yeah, I would say, you know, engaging with the enemy, fighting bad guys, shooting your your weapon is a is a fraction of the other things that you do. That is much takes up much less of your time than the engagement with the population and helping mm -hmm. the population and working with the security forces of the host nation and, and trying to get them on a footing so that, you know, they will be successful. And so in one of the things that that we so so let's be clear, right? The US goes in, we chase Osama bin Laden, we didn't we we didn't kill him or eliminate him, we chased him and he went off into Pakistan. Um, the Taliban the government fell, but the Taliban were still there. And so now you gotta like put a government together, a government has to come together, but you're now, the reason what you were doing when you first were there is like the Taliban who are still fighting to regain power again, they're attacking 
civilians, they're attacking cities, they're attacking you, they're attacking the Afghan military and the police. I mean, they're still fighting. So you're over there in support of all of this fighting that's happened to keep them from getting back into power. And Correct. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's really intense, right? Because, you know, for you all, like what, what's really important, I mean, this is one of the, the struggles of war and being, being like anti-war, really understanding war, right? When you, you know, when I put that list of, that's just some of the things that the Taliban represented. So like, how many want to live, if the Taliban got control of your nation, how many people want to live under them? You, you know, and so here, here's this other army, the so-called invading army, the invading Americans who are coming in to say, hey, we're going to, we're going to take, we're, first off, we're coming in because we got to get this bin Laden guy, but also we're going to like put a government in place that's going to represent who you are. The, so women aren't walking around in burqas when they leave their homes, for example, right? So, um, so let me, let's look at a, next slide. Um, so here's you with some folks on one of your one of your teams yeah that's just us out on a patrol that's the the crew of my you know my vehicle we had our uh you know there's an air force guy there on the the bottom right uh, my driver immediately to my right and then uh my uh pfc craig private first class craig she was uh part of our female engagement team because you know there was still a lot of cultural um reasons why females would not talk to us understandably uh, so we, you know, we relied heavily on our female soldiers to engage with women, encourage them to, you know, let their kids go to school, let the little girls go to school, get health care that we made available. You know, they were very hesitant. So uh, we used our females to, to really be the primary engagement tool with other Afghan females to encourage them to take advantage mm -hmm. of some of the some of the services that we were able to set up mm -hmm. with the Afghan government. Yeah, re really. I mean, just really in intense. Right. Uh, Nick, can you go to the next slide? So here, so introduce this handsome guy here. Yeah, so the guy next to me is uh, General Akram, General Akram Samay. Um, so that was my last uh, tour in Afghanistan in uh, 2014. Uh, the majority I got there in January 2014 and left in October. So, you know, about nine or ten months uh, there. And he was, we shared a... Uh, a forward operating base in Zabul province. So he's got his, uh, you know, couple thousand Afghan soldiers that he's in charge of. He's a brigade commander. And, uh, you know, I have a couple thousand soldiers of a task force. And we live, we live, we eat together, we, we fight together, we, um, you know, we support. I'm, I'm there, I'm supporting him. That's my responsibility is to support him, make him successful. We go through two iterations of national elections because the first one required, a, you know, a runoff because it was so close. Uh, you know, we, again, we did all those other things, working with the people, trying mm -hmm. to, one of the big things in the election was trying to encourage females to vote uh, because it was still somewhat culturally taboo. Um, so just, you know, but every day, every day, me and uh, General Akram are just working together and just doing everything. We're that, I mean, that attached to the hip there, I mean, quite literally, yeah. in some cases, I spent, you know, 18, 20 hours a day where he was within arm reach of me. And, uh, you know, through that year, we became, became very good friends. Um, and even after I left Afghanistan at the end of 2014, we, you know, remained in contact until, till today, mm -hmm. you know, till now. So he, uh, okay, next slide. So here you are. Well, now I'm just going to roll through some photos, right? That's you on the right. Um, yeah, we're just having a, I'm not exactly sure which one. This was kind of a, like a daily occurrence. Uh, General Akram is there, General Saki, some interpreters, the governor of the province. Um, and we're just having a daily kind of security meeting, it looks like, you know, just talking about, it's probably the run up to the election. Uh, and we're just, you know, we're just trying to work on what areas need assistance, where we can, where can we leverage the assets that we have. Just kind so, of a and, and the thing. idea here is just you're really getting support to the Afghan government. So it's like you got to move on your own. This is one of the things that, you know, we have the, with this idea that the Afghans can't govern themselves, right? It's like, no, 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 hang on. We, we can't govern ourselves without support. Nobody can. Like, you have to have support. You have to have people that comes together. So next, next one, 
Um, again, a similar kind of photo. Next photo. Um, here's a, a sure, right? Like the. This is, you know, we, we used to go out to the uh, outlying villages all the time to, you know, try to try to hear what they needed to say. Again, you know, I think what I like about this photo is there's no Americans in it. We're just there to help them out. You know, we we flew out there because they didn't at the time have a lot a robust uh, helicopter element. So we flew them out there so that they could get access to their people. So the people out in those rural areas felt connected to the government. They would go out, have a shura, hear what the issues were, what was the most pressing thing. And then we would, you know, kind of go back and try to figure out how we could assist mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that community down the road with the and, resources. And not force, not imposing us on it. It's, like, it's got to come from them. Yeah. I mean, at this phase in, in 2014, we were we were really behind the scenes. We really Got, yeah. tried to present very little U.S. appearance, you know, very little U.S. interaction. We did only those things that the Afghans just did not have in capability yet, yeah. like a helicopter. Okay. Next slide. Um, here's after, oh, this guy, I just love that shot. And I think that about that is you just see these soldiers, man. They, they are like fighting for their country, right? They're fighting for... Yes, sir. This young man, he was familiar with the movie Rambo, and he had seen that before, so he, he liked the way that the ammunition around him, he thought he looked like a, you know, a badass, I guess, and uh, he was just, he was a happy guy no matter what. A lot of, lot of nights out in the dirt, a lot, uh, lot of heat, and he was just always smiling. That's good. That's great. I mean, I love that photo. All right, next one. Uh, these are this is after they voted, right? So you put your finger in ink, and the ink stains right. for right. Keep you from voting more than once. So when you go to vote, and that's just showing all the all the security leaders and the governor of the province, you know, demonstrating that they had voted that day. And the and the man on the left, that's Akram, right? That's Akram on the left, correct? Yeah. Okay. So now, so you get you get the scene, right? This guy here, Rich, he's deployed five times. You said to Afghanistan, correct? couple times to Iraq, five times to Afghanistan. Um, so he's there on the ground. So he gets it. He, he meets folks. He meets Afghans. And one thing that I, the first conversation that we had together, that, you know, you had said how much you really enjoyed our project, because you said people have to talk to each other. Like, if people aren't talking to each other, we're not making progress. And just in, a, like, a minute, why is that important for soldiers? Like, what did you see that other people wouldn't see about the value and importance of people talking to people on the other side of the world. It's just a, you know, an understanding of, of their culture, their, you know, what drives them, what's important to them. And it's different in every, every country and it's different in, in various parts of the country. What's, what's good in Kabul is not good um, in Kandahar. Uh, it's different. And, you know, the first time I deployed, in 2003, 18 months after 9/11, you know, my understanding of Afghanistan was, I mean, ridiculous. Nothing. I knew I knew very little other than a book I had read, literally on the plane over the first time I went. So you, so you went into Afghanistan almost like guns ablazing, just like I don't give a shit about these people. I'm just going to. Absolutely. I mean, it was kind of the mantra, you know, in my mind was, you know, the the guy with the biggest gun makes the rules, and I was going there to make the rules and we were going to solve the problems and it very you very quickly realize that that doesn't work you know conflict can just breed more conflict if you don't know what what drives the people it's the, not, right it's like the most successful war is one in which nobody dies and you never fire a shot right i mean this is you know you you have and this is the miss it's like with the police the more i've worked with people in the military the more people in the military who have experience of war, people like you, the more this idea of successful war is one where we don't have to, where nobody dies, like where people are talking, they're dialoguing, they're engaging, and we don't have to escalate it to the next level. But when you're on the outside of it, that's not what we think about, that's not what we see, and that's, of course, the glories of war that you see in the cinemas is not the, what you see on the ground in the middle of it all. No, that, that's just movies. Yeah, yeah. That's also the really kind of terrible piece of this. Okay, uh, next slide. So the Taliban, 2000, let's take us up to August 2021. The Taliban have been really, really threatening. They've been moving into certain parts of Afghanistan, but ultimately they roll into Kabul and they take over the government. Now, in this time, 
Go back to our team. Remember the photos of our team in, 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 uh, in, du in New Delhi, in Mumbai, in Dubai. Um, think about Akram. Think about all these folks. Like, they're now in Afghanistan. And their lives are in danger because the Taliban are coming in and they want revenge. Is that how you would say it? Like, they want... Yep. They, they had been, you know been chased in their mind, been chased out of the country that they had lived in, um, and they wanted to take it back and take the spoils of that, you know, retaking that. And the people who have been working with people like us, with Americans or Westerners, these, these guys, they're all the enemies. So the Rafis of Afghanistan, he's an enemy. Akram is an enemy. And so these guys, the one thing that's right on their agenda is they're going to they're gonna go after these guys. Now, mind you, Rafi, all the folks who are in certain these positions, they've been getting death threats from the Taliban for a long time. In fact, in 2019 or in 2020, in Social 19, we took a, a uh, we raised $1,100 to send a protective vest over to Afghanistan for Rafi because he had been getting so many death threats and he had been in this class and he spoke to the class, it, like Bassem and Mr. Rashidi, and he had been getting so many death threats and his colleagues had been getting systematically killed by the Taliban, assassinated, that we said the very least we could do is send him a protective vest, okay? But at some point in time, so the, so the lives in danger, this is a really serious matter for Rafi in particular because he had been working to support women and girls and as part of the Afghan Independent Bar Association. So the, Af the, the Taliban wanted him out of there. And for, for Akram, it's because of who he was. And by that time, Akram had retired, um, you know, and I had earlier encouraged him to maybe consider applying for a visa to the United States. And he, you know, had never considered it and had no desire to pursue that course of action. I was worried about, you know, what was going to happen in the future. And he, you know, said, you know, this is this is my country and I'm staying. And his, you know, his wife was a school teacher, taught girls in yeah. uh, school. His son uh, was, uh, you know, basically a district attorney, a rule of law for a judge. So, I mean, they were the whole family was kind of involved in those activities that the Taliban, you know, viewed as problematic and against what they wanted to promote. So the government falls. Next slide. Um, and we, we got to get them out because if we don't get them out, they're not going to survive. Okay. So Rich, I call Rich to say, Hey, can you help me get Rafi out? And he knew Rafi and Rich says, yeah, but we got to get Akram out. And I said, okay, well, let's work together. We'll get them both out. And so we bring Serge into this conversation. And because Serge, it's the three of us now working together. We got to get these guys out because we have to save their lives. Like literally, like there's no, there's not a question. Okay. They, they, if they don't get out, they will not survive. Okay. So now we're working to get them out. This is them at the airport with Akron's son and trying to get into the airport. So I want you to say a couple words about this. Go to the next slide. Um, this is Rafi. Roman, his wife, and his two, the two, his two daughters, right? This is them at the airport. It's 115 degrees on this day. There's no shade. It's nothing but sun. It's 115 degrees. Everybody's flocking to the airport to get out. Next slide. Um, this is them in a taxi leaving the first day. They couldn't get into the airport, so they left and had to go back home and then try again the next day. And I show this photo because I want you to just really imagine. So Ra Rafi, if Rafi doesn't get out of Afghanistan, he dies. Okay? He dies. There's no question. They've ordered, they're hunting him down. They're hunting both of these men down because they're in control now. So they're, they're after them and they're tracing them and they're trying to find them. So next slide. Um, this is the photo. It's the key photo because he finally got into the airport. And once he got into the airport, they were going to kick him out of the airport. The Belgians were, because we got him to get on a Belgian plane. 
And I just want to show you this because this is kind of one of those interesting things where it says happenstance, right? It's just chance. But he happened to have gone to a Belgian military, uh, 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 an army base. So Lori sent him this photo and said, listen, show them this photo of you at the army base. And he showed them the photo, and this is the photo that kept them from sending him back out of the airport. And if he had gone out of the airport, that was it. He was never going to get out, and that would be the end of it. So a really fascinating just piece right there. Okay, next slide. So, and then this is Rafi and, and his family. This is them when they arrived at the airport in, in the, the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. But go to the next one. Now, let me introduce you to these two guys. So now we have the rest of our team to get out. And Rich and Serge and I put our heads together and say, what are we going to do? How are we going to get these guys out? The guy on the left, Harry, had contacted me five months earlier because he watched the Social 119 class and he said, can you speak to our students? And I said, yeah, I can. And how about maybe we'll do it in the, in the fall or something, right? So we went back and forth many times. And at some point in time, he gave me three dates. And I said, okay, in like uh, early August. And I said, all right, hang on, I'll get back to you. And I never got back to him. And then one morning, I wake up or I go to bed and I, I wake up at like two in the morning and I send him a text and I said, Harry, listen, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you with a date, but I'm trying to get our team out of Afghanistan. I have no idea why I said that. There's no reason I would have ever said that to him because I don't know this guy, right? And Harry texts back and says, call me, I can help you. And I'm like, holy shit. All right, so I wake up in the morning and I call him and he says, okay, let's do this, I'm in. So now it's the three of us. And so it's Harry and Niels, this is their little headquarters where they started doing the work they needed to do because ultimately we got our team into the Netherlands because we worked in the Netherlands. And so they were, we were able to fly them into the Netherlands and, Netherlands and now that's where they're living as, as refugees. But this is them toasting when we finally knew that we got them out, okay? So, and the Mandeville Academy is the academy that, that Harry started and he directs. Okay, next slide. So walk, walk us through. This is the evacuation, right? You remember this. Like you were, we were all on the phone. We had our Afghan team and all at their homes in Kabul. And we said, okay, go to the airport, right? So tell us what that means, getting to the airport. Uh, for, you know, for Akram and his family, it started, a, you know, a few days before this, he called me and said the tell, he was in Kabul trying to get some documents that he thought he might need in the future. And he called me and said, the Taliban were at my house last night. They threatened my wife, they threatened my kids. They know, you know, I know they're looking for me. They said they're looking for me. You know, what do we do now? What should I do now? And I said, um, you know, I told him, I said, hey, just tell them to come to Kabul. Just tell them to leave. You know, this is his home, right? His, his vehicle's there, his home is there, all his belongings are there, everything that he has um, ever built for himself and his family. And I said, tell them to come to Kabul. Um, and he said, okay, and when they get to Kabul, what's, what do we do then? And I said, I don't, I don't know yet. I'll, <laughs> don't I'll know. figure it out. But I know it's like a 10-hour bus ride, so we'll figure it out. Um, and that's when I started talking to Sam, you know, and we got them into a safe house in Kabul. Uh, we started producing documents that we thought would help them get through the gate, you know, verifying their service, verifying their association with the world in conversation with NATO. You know, anything that we thought we could generate, we're calling everybody we can, the, the U.S. State Department, the White House, the White I had a, House. I, had a I mean, literally anybody the that White would pick up the phone, and, yeah. and, and quite frankly, they're they're overwhelmed. Everybody is trying to call anybody they know to help their Afghan friends out. Uh, so we, you know, they they one of the houses has a printer, so they're printing documents. Yeah. Uh, we're tracking on a map. We're getting uh, information from other army veterans, and people are trying to get out about checkpoints, and we're giving them information about the route. Um, you know, I have one of my cadets, there was a cadet at here at Penn State and now is an army officer who happens to be uh, on the airfield. Um, so I'm, I'm sending her information saying, hey, I think I'm going to send them to this gate at this time. Um, you know, and she can't, she can't provide information that's of a security risk. So I would periodically, you know, get like a, the thumbs down emoji 
like don't do that one so we would pick a different gate knowing that that one maybe was not going to work and for three days three we days, just man. we we bounce these families around to the various gates uh just trying to get them in they're standing in waist deep in sewage yeah here i'll show you a couple photos but the key is harry and Niels. these people we never met he'd never talked to them before we never met and they're like making this happen in the Netherlands, like just by complete chance, right? I mean, these amazing guys. So here's the, the airport, right? It was a massive place. Um, go to the next slide. So what people have to do is they got to get over this. What, they're, what those people are standing in is waist high sewage, right? Well, you don't see there. They're standing in sewage. They have to go through the sewage to get up to where the where the military is and everybody has their papers. People have like a piece of paper from who knows, wherever. But they're all, everyone's trying to get out of Afghanistan and they're holding these papers, hoping that the soldiers will let them up and then put them inside the airport. But it was only the people who had official documents to get on an airplane that could go. And our people were, had official documents, but we couldn't get them into the airport. So you, you remember, I mean, this is just like a scene of... Right, so I mean, this, this goes on, this scene goes on for days. We send them there at various times because what they would do is open a, open a gate and try to get some people in that were supposed to get in, but then too many people would swarm the like gate. Like 20,000 So they so. would close the gate and then open another gate maybe a mile away. So we were constantly trying to send our families to where we thought the next gate was going to be, where they could get in. We just, we thought if somebody could just view their documents... Uh, we'd get them they out. They would get them in. And we knew once they got on the airfield, more than likely they would get out. Uh, but we were, we were up against time, right? Because there's all the reports. You know, I'm talking to people that I know at the airfield, and they said, it's, it's, we're 24 last, hours out. It's yeah, last planes are leaving. Like, he's getting the inside intel. We're getting inside intel. Last planes are leaving, man. If we don't get these guys on the plane, we know that a couple of them are going to die, right? This is it. So we're... He, once again, you, you see this shot, go to the next one. Um, so then the Dutch say, hey, this, the Dutch military say, have them put an orange thing on their phone and don't tell anybody. So as long as they, so Lori gets the message. Lori sends this photo, that's my wife on her deck, sends the photo to Rashidi and team. Put this on your phone, hold it up at night. They'll see it and they'll, bring you over. It's the only thing. Otherwise, they're not going to, they don't know who it is. They have no idea. There's 300 seats on a plane and we don't know who the 300 people are. So now it's getting down to the last minute. This is Rashidi and Sara, who you met the other day. You met Sara, who they are now like, okay, they got inside. Um, and that, that in Dutch that says, put the, turn your telephone screen to orange. Go, go to the next one. Uh, this is one of our people up there who, this is Maliha, who got, who was able to get over onto the other side. And next slot, this is, uh, this is Akram and, yeah, his family. This is them going, to, they're out on the airfield now. We got them out. Like, in, and yeah. like that last picture, you know, I'm sure you, you heard about, you know, the Abbey Gate and the explosion there that killed 12 U.S. Uh, Marines uh you know right there that that picture was right there and that picture was right there like three hours before that happened and once that happened nobody nobody else got in they closed all the gates they welded them and they and they just cleared the people that were already in so they our families literally got in you know minutes a few hours yeah. before no yeah. one else got out and there's you know there's still people that we know that we are tracking that we're trying to help that are still there uh, but this this particular group literally got in by a few minutes or mm -hmm. they would they would probably still be there mm -hmm. or wouldn't be because they would have been killed. Here's another. This is uh, next slide. You think about getting on an airplane. This is the airplane. man. There's a, this is not like taking a Delta flight. This is sitting on everyone's just sitting right next to each other on the floor of a big cargo plane flying out. Um, Next slide. And so in June, so Lori and I uh, and Bassem went to, to Europe to see the team. And this is us with Rafi and his family and the girls. This is Roman and the girls um, in, their, in their new home. And, and mind you, like, next slide. What I, this is 
Aunt, Aunt Lori with the girls, and uh, <laughs> I love that photo. Um, they, next slide. What I had said to Rafi was, hey, listen, like, you're my friend. Like, um, you're my friend. Like, like you, know, you know, like, you know, like you with Akram, you know that your, your friend's going to die if you don't, if you can't make something happen. Like, I have, have tears in my eyes now. Like, this guy, like, I, I cried so many times knowing when we didn't think we were going to get him out and knowing that the, his g girls would be without a father. And he's such a cool father. This guy's a cool father. Rafi's a cool father. And like, and what I said was, listen, we're going to get you out and tell Roman that when we get you out, the only thing that I want is for her to cook an Afghan meal for me. And that was the meal. That was the first meal. Like, it's so, it so cool. Next slide. Um, this is Rashidi and two other people, men who are on our team. This is us in the Netherlands, outside of the Mandeville Academy. Um, next slide. And this is, this is Mr. Rashidi's family. That's Sara in the front, in front of me, who you met. Um, next one. Um, this is, we went to Akram's house. And so I had said to Akram's son, he called me, he called you, and then he called me. He had a son that was outside of Afghanistan. He was so afraid for his father. And I said, listen, Rich, I promised Rich that I'll work to get your father out. And I promise you that I will do everything I can do to get your father out. I said, but I want two things in, I want two things from you. I said, I want your wife to cook me a meal and I want you to have a beer with me. And in like, Muslims don't drink alcohol. And I said, that might be part of your, your father's religion, but in my religion, if you save someone's life, you're obligated to have a beer with them. So this is now my religion. So we're gonna have a beer together and a meal. So we went to their house and next, next slide. And that was the meal, amazing meal. If you ever have a chance to have, right, Afghan food. <laughs> if you ever have a chance to have Afghan food, have Afghan food, it's amazing food. And next slide, there we are, having a beer together. <laughs> That was it. That was the high, that's, this right there, that photo is one of the highlights of my entire life. Now, you didn't get over there, so you haven't had your beer with him yet, but yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. Any, any, uh, how, how, just before we bring, okay, hang on one second. Can you, how, how, how is, just for you though, like how is it to know that like your, this is your friend. How is that to know he's out? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, I like a lot of probably army veterans that were in Afghanistan in August of 2021 really struggled, uh, you know, with that feeling of all those things that we had tried to do you know, all those positive things that we tried to build there in terms of, you know, healthcare clinics and wells and schools and, and, and democratic elections for, you know, all levels of government and rule of law, that it just kind of evaporated within a couple of days. Like it just, you know, like my, my entire adult life, right? Like I graduated college and I started doing that and I did it all the way up until, you know, I was, I was 40 years old and then it just all, you know, I used to really bank, bank on, you know, what was my why in life? What was my accomplishment? And I used to say, well, you know, the things I did in Afghanistan helped a lot of people. And then it just all kind of went away, you yeah. know, and there was a yeah. lot of feeling of frustration and anger and sadness, um, you know, and it's a little bit of, for me anyways, a little bit of solace in that, you know, I, I didn't, you know, maybe didn't have a lasting impact on Afghanistan, unfortunately, but I think Sam, you know, who brought the team together and the other people that hopefully we did something um, worthwhile and we salvaged something out of that by getting these families um, out and getting their children out so that they have a future because, you know, particularly those little girls, 
they would they would not have a future in Afghanistan, at least yeah. not in the near term. And they wouldn't have a father. And and Akram's family would not have a father. Hey, let's uh Yeah, here we go. Here you can come right here, Rich. Right? Here's the camera. Rafi. <laughs> Akram. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, Saib. Rafi. Wait, hang, hang on. I want my class to hear you say that to him, actually. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, assalamu alaikum, Commander Saib. <laughs> so listen, Rafi. Uh, yeah, I want uh, ask Akram uh, how how it is for Akram to see Rich here talking about his story. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that uh, so for the first time I face to face meet with Mr. Rich Geary and also some Richard and also the students in this big class, and I'm so glad. Uh, uh, I heard uh, the, the story which uh, 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 Rich Gary's uh, 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 told uh, from our uh, relation and also activity in Afghanistan. And I uh, uh, and I remember some of the nice uh, uh, um, experience and also story that uh, I want to share with you. Uh, the international, the international. Sports in Afghanistan was have uh, a common theme, like uh, uh, to to work, to fight, uh, uh, like uh, side, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Ibi shor amali buda bayne mo. Yeah. Comment. Mushtarakan baham mishistem. Kabir Khan. Yeah, we sit together and we plan for what to do. Uh, uh, we plan this together according to the character, the, to the tribes, and the, all the things. Yeah, we see all the things that we plan to work. Well, well, what was really important for us, we invite people to not fight against the government and uh, we work together and uh, to bring people. Hey, wait, the hang on. All right, uh, hang on once. Wait one second. Hey, Rafi, Rafi. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, listen. Um, your, I think your microphone is better than Mr. Rashidi's, so if you can, um, I'm going to need you, if you could translate, but we have, I have a question for, first for Akram, okay? 
Um, uh, how, how, what, what, what was, what was it like, uh, what was Rich like in Afghanistan? What was it like working with Rich in Afghanistan? جلسه به که تجربه شخصی دارم از کار کردن با آقای ریچ چی بود در افغانستان و مؤثریتشان در افغانستان چی بوده بود ما گیری در منصب داریم شوق قوی است و ما یک جمله را در در برابر گیری استفاده کردیم که او به گیری تکرار است اما به دوستایی که میشنون جدید است ما به گیری یک جمله گفتیم Okay, Rafi. Uh, yeah, he is a strong and expert soldier, and uh, I always call him one of the uh, one of the. Uh, um, uh, I, I I was call him uh, a specific name, so I told him in Afghanistan, but today. I share with you the, this, this, you know, a specific name for the Mr. Regeri. Wawiri Jabla Raguftim ke Malate Amrika Eftekhar Mokona ke Madari Radara ke Dawu U Madar Giri Raba Dunia Orla. Yeah, uh, uh, I want to, yeah, the, the, the people of America to be proud that uh, American has a, a, model, a model, and uh, so you know this model is just born a uh, son, and his son's name is Richard Gary. Yeah, awesome, uh, awesome. Hang on, hang, hang. I so I have another question for you, Rafi. Um, so you were. That's a really tell Akram that that's a really nice thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, because he was so strong and he was so professional uh, 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 besides of the, you know, military and also in fighting with the social uh, connection with the people and uh, also to, to and, and uh, socialize with the people. So that will be help uh, me and, and my team and also the people to be uh, uh, most friendly with, with the army and, and, and everything will be, uh, you know, solved, the problem will be solved. Yeah, so listen, hey, uh, so Rafi, thanks for that. Um, I think that what I, what I, what I want to emphasize to my class is that what he said was, what is so important is what this soldier who is there we imagine that the soldier is there to fight. But in fact, this soldier was there. What was so notable about him was the way he was able to work with and socialize with the people and be with the people because he knew that in the end, when the fighting is over, people have to get along. They have to work together. And like, that's not a thing. It's a, it's a level of wisdom that oftentimes is missed in these sort of Hollywood theatrical productions of war. Um, hey, Rafi, I have a question for you. Um, so you've been in Soch 119. First off, my friend, it's really lovely to see you. I remember the, uh, man, I, I'm gonna, just seeing you here. Uh, I remember the day that we didn't think we were going to get you out and I, I cried um, tears that I had not, I had never cried before. Um, and uh, because I just, I thought I was gonna lose my friend. And um, because, yeah, so it's so amazing to see you on the screen. So, um, yeah, so I just wanna say that to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. And um, you've been in Social 119 and 
what, what, do you, what, do you, what do people need to know? It's if you could just in a couple minutes about, about Afghanistan and about, about Afga- the Afghan people, right? And then I'm going to ask Rich to also respond to this. What do we need to know about you? Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, um, I would like to thank Mr. Uh, Sam for giving me and uh, my colleague the opportunity to be in the class. And uh, hello, uh, uh, my friend, Rich Gary. It's, uh, to, it's nice to meet you again. Uh, you know, the topic, uh, uh, Sam, the topic for uh, today classes, uh, uh, um, evacuation uh, uh, of Afghanistan and the situation of August 2021. And the, the, the dramatic fall of the Kabul in 2000. 21, in August 2021, and reestablishment of the Taliban government, uh, you know, results in the end of two decades of the progresses, social development, and the rule of law. So for this reason, causing of individual, including many professional, like, like my team, and other people to fly from Afghanistan. And among these people in August 2021 are my family and my colleagues are. So however, uh, uh, I remember at that time, the decision to take a uh, fly from Afghanistan was very difficult to leave. And also because uh, uh, we had a family, we had everything in Afghanistan. And, uh, but uh, 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 we went out to survive because as you mentioned before, we are the main target of the Taliban at that time. And I appreciate it for everyone, especially for you, Mr. Reg Gary and, and Serge, and all teams to helping me, my, my colleagues, my family to get out. And now we are say, in a safe place. And uh, you know, Sam, every time I remember August 2021, I got shocked. Mm. I remember how did I take myself to the airport from the Taliban checkpoint in Herat provinces? For the first day when the Taliban take the control of Herat, while my family and children stay in Herat, and I could not take them with me. And also I remember with the time when I decided with difficult the difficulty that my family and children will come to Kabul by road with the serious risk for the two day traveling. Yeah. And I still remember, you know, the time when my wife and two children tried to enter the airport together with Mr. Uh, with Mr. Respect General Saib Akram. We tried for three days to enter in the Kabul airport. Even thought we had a document, but our effort was unsuccessful. But finally we entered in the airport. And I still remember, as you mentioned, that the time when we, when the Belgian comes military soldier decided to take me and my family after four day, hard, you know, uh, 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 trying to get in airport to out as from airport just because of their lack of the internal co- coordination, yeah. our airport team with the Belgian, military, Belgian embassy in Islamabad. So at that time, I remember you, I, I remember that time, it, it was night, I think. Yeah. You, Rich Gary and, and, and Lori and also Serge and all family are just working, just, just they, they're trying to, to find some solution for this. And I appreciated that. I yeah. really appreciated that. Yeah, you, know, you were, you are, are, yeah, you're our friend. Yeah. In the but end, he, the, one of the solutions was because yeah, Serge yeah, had an I old saw, drinking buddy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I saw the picture. I saw the picture, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, one, one, the, but listen, the, Rafi, we have just 30, we have 30 seconds because Rich is going to get the last word in here, so. Yep. Yeah, uh, just a final, uh, um, final words for, for, the, for, for all of my colleagues. Uh, you know, now we are 
now we the, we have the experience of the living in Axel, and uh, one of my wish for all the people to want to know sh never uh, should ever for the force to leave the people from the original homeland, mm. and no one should be disadvantage of the living for their homeland. Yeah. The experience is difficult, especially for those who had dreamed for the future, and we had dreamed for future, and we built, we, we start 20 years ago uh, to, to build everything, but, but everything just, you know, yeah. destroyed in, in, in one week. You know that all those wish can be fulfilled when we all speak out and raise the wise for peace in a state of war. Yeah. Because war is destroy everything. Yeah. And uh, you know, you see now in Afghanistan, yeah. and we lost everything. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Rafi. Yeah. Yeah, Rich. Hey, Rich. Yeah. Rich, can you say, just you got in 30 seconds, what did you learn about Afghans and Muslims? that you just wish people would know about these, about these people, right? What do, what do we need to know? I think, uh, you know, my first experience in Afghanistan and with the Muslims I had in my head, you know, I categorized them all into one, one category. The people of Afghanistan, they had attacked, nine, you know, our country. It was driven by their religion. And that's not true. And it's not true in Afghanistan or Iraq and some other places I've been. There's always small factions of people that are willing to misrepresent, exploit, and do bad things. But the majority of people are good people. They just want to have families and, and do good things. You just have to look past the bad representation and find the goodness in people. Because it's out there in every country and every religion. It's all there. Thanks for visiting. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being who you are. You've taught me many things, uh, and I think a lot of important lessons. And I think what you just said, like I can say that, but coming from you, uh, a, a, a military officer, um, it's so important. And it's and so, hey, everybody, thanks for being part of class. Just another round of applause for everyone. Thanks, team. <laughs>